Gather round, my fellow Sheikers, for in this video, we shall delve into the captivating world of end-to-end -end protocols. In our previous escapade, we witnessed the majestic IPv6 in action, routing packets through the labyrinth of routers to reach their destined abode. For the protocols above IPv6, it appears as a direct point-to-point -point conversation, akin to two friends exchanging profound revelations across a crowded room. First, let us introduce the unassuming UDP, a protocol of few fields yet great potential. The first two fields, named ports, serve as identifiers, whispering to applications at both ends, this precious data is for you. Typically, we have a server identified by a well-known value, one that you must commit to memory with utmost reverence 5683, the sacred identifier of a co-op server. The client, meanwhile, selects its own value, a secret code shared only with the server. Much like IPv6, we eschew the notion of source and destination ports, preferring instead to embrace the stability of application and device ports. Stability, my friends, is the bedrock upon which we build our grand designs. But wait, that's not all. UDP also includes a checksum, a peculiar yet essential guardian protecting both IPv6 and UDP from the perils of transmission errors. It's as if a watchful sentinel stands vigilant, ensuring our precious data arrives unscathed. Now, my dear fellow explorers, let us roll the drums. And as envisioned by the illustrious IETF, dive headfirst into the fascinating universe of CoAP and the restful principles, the very foundation upon which modern computing and IoT are built. In the RESTful model, a client-server relationship blossoms with the server holding resources, each identified by a unique name or path. The combination of the server's name and this path forms the URI, or in words, Uniform Resource Identifier, a baptismal ceremony conferring upon each resource a name recognized worldwide. But don't be confused by the too much proximity with a file system. These resources are not mere files containing data, they can be inextricably linked to the tangible world, their values gleaned from the profound insights of sensor scanning universe parameters. In a client-server interaction, the client accesses resources on the server through various methods like retrieving, storing, modifying, or deleting them. Let's look at how this works. The get method allows the client to retrieve a specific resource from the server. The server responds with a copy of that resource, which can be stored in a file or even a real-time value from a physical sensor, which means that the answer may not be instantaneous. Along with the resource content, the client receives metadata like a hash value to check for changes later. An expiration duration, the content format JSON in our case, and the approximate size. This information helps the client understand and work with the resource effectively. The put method gives the client a way to store a new value for an existing resource or create a new resource on the server using the provided URI. The post method works similarly, but the server assigns an identifier to the new resource and returns it in the response. Now, you might wonder where the constraint device fits into the REST paradigm, is it the client or the server? The answer is flexible, it can be either or both, depending on the scenario. In one case, the server can reside on the constraint device itself. This way, clients on the internet can use GET requests to retrieve values directly from the device. Alternatively, the constraint device can act as a client using POST requests to send its values to a known server. This setup allows controlled access to the device's data. As you can see, the REST paradigm offers versatile options for integrating constraint devices into client-server architectures. In our next discussion, we'll dive deeper into how the CO protocol facilitates these interactions. I'm looking forward to exploring this topic further with you.